So let's look at something else. Oh, this one we, I really was struck this morning when we were listening to it. And also in the example that uh, Simon played from something else. Um, does that remind you of anything in, in the other Wagner work? Uh, what if I played the, the one from the third act that he played for us? That one adds a little element which makes it... You know what was happening? That's when um, uh, the, 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 uh, Grunemans has just come on the scene after, had, in, in terrible agony having had a sleepless night and yet he somehow becomes charmed by the beauty of the place and, and it's this, he's, this, the, it has, he's the seduction of nature. So here we have the same basic idea in a place where there's Was that remind you of anything? What if what if it what, what, what? What's this from? Where? All right, this is the beginning of the forest murmurs. He's, Siegfried's lying under the tree and he's enraptured by nature. So it's the same music. Um, it's the same idea exactly. I mean, it's, uh, I, there's no reason to get technical, but, it, but it's, Wagner is borrowing from himself, as it were, again. Um, it doesn't sound the same. Don't get me wrong, it never sounds the same. It doesn't sound the same, first thing, because the whole piece has a different luminosity, a different sound, a different basic context, world. But also the orchestration is different. Nevertheless, the, the, the idea is an idea that he's borrowing from himself. Then there's a, um, a kind of a bigger one, um, a more general similarity, one that has been written a lot about. And I had originally thought I would talk about entirely, but it, it would probably become technical. Okay, what, what just happened? kind of momentous, especially context, because nothing whatsoever has happened before then, so finally something just happened. Kundry just arrives on stage, first time in Act One. We have all this, all of a sudden it gets very going. Somebody pointed out that this, the sort of galloping, uh, that rhythm, which doesn't have to be so dissonant as it is here, um, is, seems very sort of um, archaic, as if he's sort of imitating himself from um, the galloping. In the ring, galloping is different, it's, it's always... That rhythm. Here it's. A different rhythm, but some, they both give the sense of sort of, you know. And, and I think that one of the reasons it sounds, who was the one who brought that up to me before there? That, that makes it sound kind of um, simple minded in the context of Parsifal is precisely because so little of Parsifal's music is descriptive, where so much of the Ring's music is descriptive. But um, actually, more of Parsifal's music is perhaps descriptive in a certain kind of way than we, I mean, for instance, like I was just showing with the, with the nature music. I mean, there are moments in it which are more descriptive, but it's seldom that it so specifically describes something in the stage action, a sort of writing. But, it, but for, for now, what I want to talk about is this harmonic, all this. What kind of chords are those? Are those pretty chords? No. no. Second act of, of Parsifal here lots of times. One of the very interesting things is, well, who are these chords associated with? Well, they're associated with Kundry here when she first comes in. 
but they're associated with Klingsor just as much. And they're associated with Amfortus just as much. When Amfortus is, is, is you know, screaming in agony before the grail, what we just saw today, it's got the same chords, the same, it's sort of, but these chords all come from from Tristan, from especially from the second act and even more from the third act of Tristan. Wagner sort of invents this whole new harmonic language. This is, this, this is, this is a sound world which had not, ex it had existed little bits of it in the, the individual chord exists like back in Gesualdo and in, in the, in the um, madrigalists to the end of the 16th century. But attaching one to the other, not, not letting go of them. I mean, where do they resolve? And this, you know, it goes on. It just doesn't resolve. You want it to go at least. You know, some, and he finally does do that. He does that, he does that once. In Tristan, he doesn't ever resolve it. Here he does, but maybe, everybody know what a resolution is? Yes, but what is, what is a resolution? That's the one I'm referring to, yes. But everybody know what a resolution in music is in generally? Shall I define resolution? Okay, well a resolution, if, if, if the idea of, of harmony is to take us away and bring us back, resolution is when we come back, and when we really finally come back. So the resolution is the arrival point. Parsifal's full of arrival points. There's lots and lots of arrival points. Tristan has essentially no arrival points until the end. Tristan, the whole metaphor of music in Tristan is about delaying the, the arrival point. This probably has a strong sexual, at least metaphoric connotation, let's say, or, or, or some meaning because it's sort of, it's delaying, delaying, delaying. And, but Parsifal doesn't have that, but he does have it in the scene with, with Kundry and Parsifal. Because that's the one scene which, of course, is, is explicitly sexual in, in nature. You know, the, the, that's, a, that's a resolution right there. Resolution means it can stop. If, if he wanted to, we, the piece could end, we could say goodbye, thank you, it's all over. So that's already, he could already write there. He does it a million times, the famous Dresden I'm in. Um, but in, in, this, in this music, in this... all from the second act when, when actually Parsifal is saying, that voice, that voice, you're killing me with your voice. He's unhappy because he's, he's been turned on. He doesn't like it. Um, but there is a final resolution at the very end. I don't know, maybe the greatest, this would be a silly thing to say, but maybe the greatest resolution in the history of music where he finally takes this incredibly dissonant, all this stuff, and really resolves it once, not in for all, because we do hear it again in the third act some, but at least at the end of the, th for the second act, where we really feel like that this incredible tension has been resolved in a way we don't at the end. We don't in Tristan until the end. At the end of the piece, we do. And, and it, it has this sort of uh, um, glorifying, uh, transcendental sort of, where you finally... Where he resolves it, you know, that way. This one is quite a different kind of resolution, but after all this incredible dissonant stuff. He says, you know where you can find me again. That's the end of the, the, the act. So it's, he goes. That's a, that's a juicy chord if there ever was one. And then he resolves it, but, but even here, he doesn't quite, he doesn't go. Or, no, it's. 
that still a resolution to be minor, but anybody know what that's called when you add that note, that accented dissonance? Which, by the way, is, I mean, the, 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 the uh, St. Matthew Passion ends with. So it's the same idea. I mean, he could Bach could have just as well gone, what are the chords, bells? He did have that, but it's a hell of a lot more, more moving to go. So what's, everybody know what that's called? What? Appoggiatura, exactly. Appoggiatura from the Italian word appoggiare. Appoggiare means to lean. It leans, that chord leans. And then it resolves, okay? So he finally, after all this incredible... It even it repeats it. And then on the wrong beat, he has the fortissimo one. Sort of, sort of, always sort of like stops you. The end of the second act of Parsifal is really, that's, that's really, really great. Okay, let's go on to um, sort of the biggest subject, which I wanted to talk about, um, the relationship between Parsifal. This is in primarily in the ring, but um, one of the things that's big in Parsifal, and we um, have already touched on this, Simon already touched on this, is a remarkably short score, a remarkably short libretto. There's a remarkably small um, amount of, of words, even though it's got chorus. You know that um, the score of Meistersinger, Meistersinger and Parsifal are essentially the same length. The score of Meistersinger is like two big fat volumes in the original. It's big, and you know, because it's, it has a fairly large orchestra, has all this chorus, you know, a chorus and lots of different characters. They all sing different lines, there's tons of it. Where here's Parsifal has lots of chorus too. It has even lots of chorus that's divided up because you've got the, the, the guys way up on top and then the guys in the middle and the guys on the ground. And you've got the voices from wherever and all this stuff. And you've got, you know, and yet, it's a little tiny score. You've got one, that's the Dover. But when you see the, the conductor, it's really remarkably small. And a lot of that is because um, Parsifal is short. I mean, it, it's just slow. There's not a lot of, uh, there's very few words and not a tremendous amount of music, but it's, it, the music is quite slow. This, um, I, I'm not gonna say any more about it because I have a question about that on my quiz. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that Parsifal does have, as does the ring, are some very prominent a musical interludes. Interludes where it's just the orchestra playing. It has short ones, like the one I was playing. The, 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 which is very similar to another short interlude, where there's nobody singing, but it's, it's relatively short. But it has some, some big long interludes too. And um, you know, if we were to put 100 musicians at random into the room, and you were to put um, and say, what's the greatest music in Parsifal? I would be willing to hazard a bet at good odds that at least 90, if not 95, of the 100 musicians in the room would say that the greatest music in Parsifal are the two transformation scenes in Acts 1 and 3. And probably most people would say the transformation scene in Act 1. The one in Act 3 is pretty, pretty great too. Um, in other words, they're transformation scenes just because the scenery changes. And in theory, that's the only reason they're called that. They're Verwandlungsmusik, which means transformations music, but there's a lot more to it than just the scenery moving. Now in the ring, there's no scene where the scenery is supposed to move. And I've never seen a production of Parsifal where the scenery really moves. Have you, Simon? No. Um, it's not even really the point, is it? No. No. Um, but in the case of the ring, think of how great and how important all the preludes to the various acts are. Now the preludes to the acts in Parsifal are great too. Uh, um, but also in, in the ring, the, the, the music between the scenes. Now, the music between the scenes in the ring fulfills one of, right off the top of my head, three different functions with some overlap. The one obvious function is it sets the scene for what, what's coming up afterwards. In other words, it sort of gets you ready for what's gonna happen. The opening of Das Rheingold is probably a pretty dramatic example of that. We've got 135 bars of just E flat major creating this sense of timeless in the bottom of the rhyme, let's say. Or, or something like um, the prelude to the first act of, of Siegfried, where we have the, the brooding music associated with Mima and a lot of, lot of the 
the, 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 a lot of music associated with the ring all over the place, kind of dominating, and things that we he haven't heard for a long time since Rheingold with the ring and the dragon and stuff, and, and, um, but also the, 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 the sort of persistent rhythm of the, of the forging. Um, so it sort of sets the scene. So when the curtain rises, we've, we're kind of ready for what happens. So that's one of the functions. Another function is really simply a bridge. It takes us from something before to something after. So this is sort of a passage music. In, 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 in theory, at least, this would be the case of the two big transformation scenes in Parsifal as well. For instance, in, in Die Valkyra, the scene, um, actually the, the, the prelude to the second act, but also the scene of the second act after Wotan's big scene with, 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 with Brunhilde, the big monologue, and Brunhilde goes off disconsolate because she's been ordered to um, kill Zygmunt. Um, and then we hear that this sort of fades back into, and now we hear Zygmunt and Sieglinde running again. So it does, a, it does a wonderful job, really, of sort of very strongly, dramatically depicting the change from one place to another place. So we go in, so it has this, this sense of, of movement. Another thing that in, um, interlude scenes do is they act kind of as a Greek chorus. They tell us about what the meaning of the scene we just saw was, and perhaps give us some intimation of what the meaning of the scene is, is, is going to come. So they're sort of acting outside the action, but talking about the action. There are lots of those. Gooder Dameron comes to mind, but I'm gonna play one in a second, which is um, um, very closely related to the one in, in uh, the ones in, in the Meisterzinger, the Meisterzinger, Parsifal, excuse me. Um, now, Wagner has lots of techniques for these, these um, orchestral interludes. I always feel like in a way that Wagner is, is sort of liberated with these orchestral limits. He doesn't have to worry about the voice and the singers getting heard or you know, putting the words in. He can just have free way with his, with his music. And I think that he's really maybe, I won't say it is happiest, but it is freest when he does that. And certainly a lot of his greatest music is in these. I don't think, would anybody argue that seriously that much of Wagner's greatest music is in the orchestral I mean, things like Siegfried's Funeral March, for instance, that also fits very strong, exactly into what I'm talking about, or the Rhine Journey, or things like this is all, these are all also uh, interludes that happen to have names, but they're, uh, Siegfried's uh, Rhine Journey is a perfect example of one that just takes us from one scene to another scene, it just carries us in time and space through, through various things. But one thing he likes to do in a lot of these scenes, part of this, I think, is, um, has to do with drama, but a lot of it has to do with just musical form, is he likes to have some overriding musical idea, which runs through, if not all of the interlude, at least a lot of the interlude, sort of as a piece of glue. And then he'll have other themes ride or over them or under them or through them, through this one thing, and sort of tell stories around them. And of course, in the ring, this is very powerful because these themes ha have already attached a lot of, of dramatic meaning to us. I mean, maybe not meaning that we could put into words exactly, but they all mean things to us. So the music becomes like a, like a commentary, but a very emotional, complex, multifaceted commentary on the action. And it's taking us from place to another. And, 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 and with this, this sort of single, we call it music ostinato, which just means stubborn, basically. Repetition, repetitious idea, which sort of unites the whole thing, but also gives it kind of a, a something to, to, to build on. Okay, so probably the first really well, that's a big statement. Some of the first great music in the ring is the interlude between scenes two and three, the famous uh, Descent into Nibelheim. Um, and, you know, we're going... guys playing on their anvils and it goes on. So we have that, which actually is a little bit like our, our galloping music, but it's, but it's full of motivic meaning, but it's this rhythm which then transforms itself in, 
which of course we're going to eventually associate very strongly with the Nibelheims and, and the Nibelungen and, and forging and whatever. But it carries the music along and we hear these other themes. We hear, for instance, which we associate something else and which we don't even necessarily associate with anything at this point, but which we will associate as later on in the ring, sort of foretell something. One of the things that music does in the ring very often is it sort of, it, it goes into its own, it creates its own future, because Wagner wants to create a multi-dimensional uh, uh, work in time. But anyway, so we have, this is a perfect example of, of music being carried by this one idea and all these other ideas right on top of it. Well, we have even perhaps a greater example of that in Parsifal, Actually, two of them in the in the two big interludes. So let's let's look at the um, the, the the first transformation scene. So gundry has gone to sleep. And what did she do in this production? Did she disappear, go into the earth? How did she? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, she's gone, and then we start hearing this new rhythm. rhythm we're eventually going to associate very strongly with what? The bells. They're the church bells. This is going to carry to the church bells. And indeed, at the climax of this, we hear only bells. And um, Wagner's description of it, which was in no way even vaguely approximated by what we saw in, in the film, but which we ever see in, in, in modern productions, is it should be so loud, the bells, he says that it should go beyond the threshold of pain. It should be, well, have you ever been inside a bell tower when they're really ringing? It's overwhelming. It should cut into your marrow, he says. Okay, it's going into your marrow on the threshold of pain. So it's the, the bells really finally just take everything over. Um, it, 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 also with those timpani of company, they can never be loud enough, ever. That's one of these places that just cannot be loud enough. And then it dies back down. But anyway, it starts here. Pianissimo, actually. He's already woven a theme into it. You know, the, so he's woven the grail theme. If you so he has that, that kind of modulation, which I was just talking about before, this sort of magical modulation, uh, which, which um, uh, 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 <clears throat> Scruton calls Fervanlung, for exactly what this is, actually, transformation. The, and, and we'll hear over and over and over and over and over in this transformation music modulations. Modulation just means a change of key that, that m m move in this sort of magical sounding direction. Imagine, let me just play for you wrong for once. What if it went like this? Sounds perfectly logical, right? But instead, Wagner goes. Does it again. He's going to do it again here. You don't expect that key. Parsifal asks, what, who's the grail? kind of getting going. Here's the modulation again. Bum, ba, bum. Here it is again.
by themselves now. I should stop because I can't play bells on the piano. Um, thank you. The one, the one you should applaud, thank you. The one who needs to be applauded in this passage is Wagner. This is really, really great stuff. Um, when he opens it up, um, as it were, it's kind of hard to describe. It's sort of like, um, and so the point here is, this is the same technique. I'm not saying this is a greater musical interlude than the prelude to the third act of, of, uh, of Siegfried, or, or the funeral march for that matter. But it's very different, and it's very different in a specifically Parsifal way, which is that whereas this is clearly some incredible transformation, we call it a transformation scene, and it's an incredible transformation. We are not in the same place after he goes to the bells that we were at the beginning. But whereas in the scenes in the ring, we can define where we've gone and where we're coming. Siegfried goes through the fire. I love to see Siegfried going through the fire. But he starts, he breaks the spear, he goes through the fire and he arrives at the top of the mountain and he's in awe and enraptured by the beauty of the scene and then he sees Brunhilde. I mean, he's, there's actual physical movement. Now there's, I suppose you could say, there's physical movement, Gurdemans and Parsifal go from one place to the other. There's a few very strange statements when uh, Parsifal says, I seem to be going very far and I haven't gone anywhere. And, and, and Gurdemont, the last thing Gurdemont says before the orchestra takes over completely, he says, you see, son, this is because here time and space become one, um, or time becomes space. It's the exact trans, what does he say exactly? Hier wird, du siehst mein Sohn zum Raum, hier wird hier die Zeit. So, yeah, time here becomes um, space. So, whatever is happening, it's not something that can be defined in sort of any physical plane or any normal dramatic plane. This ties in very well, I think, with what Simon was saying, that um, he's using a technique here that which he's developed in the ring of, of having this fantastic panoply of themes, go with this one theme which is kind of carrying the whole thing, and he's taking us from one place to another. But he's not taking us from any one physical place. I don't know exactly, or maybe I do, but I, I choose not to say, um, where I think the place is gone, but he certainly, we are not. I thought that the, this production was very weak in this um, standpoint, because where they arrived looked pretty much exactly the same as where they left from. And that certainly is not the case of the music. I don't know what production should do, but they need to reflect the music. I think that's a good, a good starting point. It's true that in Parsifal that's different than it is in the other Wagner works, precisely because the music is less 
a direct depiction of the, of the physical action, the stage, which includes the decor. But some kind of change, whether it doesn't necessarily have to be decor, but something very, something so momentous happens in the music, it, it should probably also happen. One more transformation scene, which in its own way is practically just as great, and which is sort of the mirror of this one, and which is, I think, almost a better example of just how Parsifal is not a drama in the usual sense of the term, um, than, uh, uh, but as great as the transformation in Act One. And that's the transformation in Act Three, well, the Frivandling's music in Act Three, when after we've had this incredibly glorious and redemptive scene, I mean, um, basically the action of Parsifal is now finished. The, the, whole, the rest of the piece is just sort of uh, putting into well, at least in theory, it's all finished. I mean, if the story is Parsifal comes back, brings the spear back to the, the, to the grail, gets crowned the king, and, and Kundri is, is saved from her eternal cycle of sins, well, that's already all happened. You know, he's brought it back. Gurnamans has, has, has anointed him with the waters of, of, uh, you know, of the, the grail fella, the, the source of the, the grail. Um, Parsifal has baptized Kundri. Kundri, who has never been able to cry, only laugh, finally cries. It's a big moment. We have the great, glorious, you know, the Good Friday music. So you really, you really don't, we don't need anything else from a physical standpoint. It's all sort of done. And yet Wagner writes this other transformation. Whereas this first transformation really seems to go from darkness to light. The second transformation, in spite of everything, seems to go from light to darkness. The, the, this is some of the gloomiest music. It ends in this, this most absolutely despairing tones. Now, why the last scene, the Parsifal, starts out so incredibly despairing, it could just simply be that Wagner is a very smart dra dramatist. This, that even though um, Parsifal is not really a drama in the, any kind of normal sense of the term, Wagner understands that he, you, know, you can't have light without dark. And so if he wants, I think Wagner has a problem, actually, in Act Three of Parsifal, because he wants the end to be this incredible transcendental experience. He wants us all at the very end to be, you know, true believers and, and, and caught up in, in, this, in this incredible ritual of, of, of redemption. But it's all sort of happened halfway through the act. And so he's got, to go, he's got to keep us in it. So by plunging us into the deepest darkness again, he then has a, someplace to go. So when, 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 even though we know what's going to happen, there's no more surprise. There's, you know, we, we only know that, that Siegfried is going to break Wotan's spear because we read it in our libretto. But we don't know it watching the piece. There's no indication that's going to happen. We don't, there's, we don't know. We know that Brunhilde is going to uh, eventually, you know, um, take the ring from the Rhine maidens and then uh, take the ring from Siegfried's hand and offer it back to the Rhine maidens and throw herself in, into a funeral pyre, uh, telling them to take the, 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 the... But we don't know all of this. This has to still happen. We, there is a certain amount of dramatic tension still involved, certainly. Um, and Tristan, certainly, in, in, in Meistersinger. We don't know that he's actually going to sing this song. I mean, we may guess it, but still, it all has to happen. But in Parsifal, it's all happened already. So in order to retain this, the sense of when he does come and actually heals the wound, we know he's going to, but he does, um, it still leaves, gives us something. He, he um, um, creates this darkness. By the way, I do not think this is the main reason. I, mean, I think this is a reason that you can't have light without darkness. I think there's a much deeper reason which goes into the, the Parsifal is, is, is not a comedy. It's not a tragedy either, but it's not a comedy. And I don't mean that it's not for laughs. I don't think it's, it's just a happy ending. And, you know, everything is great and, and glorious and hunky-dory from now on kind of thing. I think it's a little more complicated than that. And I think maybe this transformation. But anyway, this one, I'm not going to play the whole thing, although I'd actually like to. It's easier. Um, it has the same bells. That's going all the way through this sort of slow winding. Um.
hard to imagine any darker music than this. By the way, these the modulations, which were so, you know, in the, in the first transformation scene, we have the same kinds of modulations, but here they actually just plunge us each time. Instead of getting brighter and brighter, they get darker and darker. And the, the arrival of the bell, this is one of the great moments in, in all of music, actually. everybody in the room it's loud music but but what's incredible here is it's such a simple uh, idea but it's amazing you know this nice nice all very happy in the first act they're singing this all this this always sounds too much to me very much like the boy scouts actually <laughs> after the grail especially very much like the boy scouts um well here in, in this transformation he's got the same bells but look at the the same and they get, they get more and more dissonant. <laughs> it's very it's like ugh, you know sort of like like slit your throat and 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 you know a, a cut your wrist sort of thing I mean it's really like really 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 dark and bleak and yet it's the same bells now what's interesting and I like can leave you just to think about is is that You'd think that if you were going to do, just in the context of a piece, that it starts with things in bad shape and ends with things in good shape, which sort of tells the story of Parsifal in a very simple way. You'd think that the first transformation would, get, would, would go in darkness, and the second transformation would go in light. But no, it's exactly the opposite. The transformations are very much mirrored of each other. They're both, very, they're both based around this bell motif. But this, 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 the second one just takes us from this very glorious and transformative and, and, and transcendental scene of, the, of, the, of, of Kunri's conversion and the, the um, uh, Karfreitag um, help Good Friday music and, and, um, and, and now we're plunged back into this the black, uh, as it were. Um, so it's very interesting just to think about why Wagner does this in the third act and not in the first act, where on the contrary, you know, where things don't look good at all, I mean, Ford is the last thing in the world he wants to do is to perf perform his duties, and yet the scene of coming from the, the woods into um, the, the palace of Montsalvat is this incredible revolution of, 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 of grandeur and light as we go up. Oh, good. Then I've just, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm glad, I'm good, I'm glad. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Any, yes? Yes. Is, is my lecture tonight revenge for Parsifal killing a swan? I don't know how I'm supposed to take that, but I'll just say yes and just be done. Yes? In that first transformation that you, that you played, the key changes every second or third measure yes, uh, right. to distant keys. Is there any precedent for that besides in Wagner? No. That's what I thought. No, <laughs> but the precedent is in Wagner. He does it, something very similar, for instance, in Siegfried going through the fire, the last part, when he wants to make it seem more and more magical, he, um, I, I could play it, but I won't, but, um, unless you want me to, but um, I could never resist. Yeah. You know, I can never resist temptation, what's the word? So, you know, anyway, it's, it's um, he's an E major. So it does that modulation.
He does one more after that, but anyway, he's, you know, each one is more sort of, um, he does it in a very, very abbreviated form in this. So far we're all in the same key. getting into the quintet of maestros here. He goes through an incredible ten of I mean, and, and um, another place where he does something, this is, this is, Wagner's good at this. I mean, to say the least. Um, what about, you know, I, don't, I, I really even shouldn't play this, but. Stop, but that goes through a lot more. Your that's from Tristan Brangenis, Habadach Brangenis watch. I mean, that goes through an incredible chain of modulations, too. What makes them a little bit different in the Parsifal one is that it's clear levels. The Tristan is swimming in weird, weird chords. You just never know what the next chord is going to be. It just, it just always sounds right. That's the amazing point. It's completely a surprise when it sounds right. But in Parsifal, like he. It's just a new key completely, um, and, he keep, and he keeps going from one to the next. But that, that, uh, but you know, um, the music, the basic music, the, the by itself sounds very much like Lohengrin. The thing is, Lohengrin he doesn't do these changes of the keys. I mean, Lohengrin doesn't have anything like this. But the the the, the material itself is, you know, it's, I mean, that's. It's in itself pretty flat material. There's not a, a whole lot, you know. Wagner does a lot, a lot of stuff with it. That's you know that Wagner didn't didn't compose that. That's called the Dresden. I mean, it's just traditional. Anybody else know who uses that? I mean, there's quite a lot of composers who use it. Mendelssohn uses it in the Fifth Symphony. Very, very. Anybody else have a question? I've sort of shocked and all. Every no, there's one back there. When you first played the Parsifal theme, it sounded vaguely like the Gibichul. Um, uh -huh. There was something about it that was... Yeah, it's chords. I mean, they, they, there's some vague resemblance, but the character is very different. Yeah, they're both kind of fanfares. The thing is, the Gibichul theme, the main quality it has is it, it's sort of um, heavy and um, plotting a little bit. And, and the parts of all what it sounds to me like a, a comic book hero theme. Um, comic, parts of all is anything but a comic book hero, but his theme sounds like one. There may be something to that. I mean, but, but I've always had problem with it, obviously. So, I mean, as I said, you could all stone me afterwards if you wish. You know, swan available for stonings. Um, Anybody else? Or are we done? Great. Okay, thank you.